Jesus, you are welcome. Let your love fill the house. Let your love fill the house. Love fill the house. Jesus, you are welcome. Let your love fill the house. Let your glory fill the house. Glory fill the house. Jesus, you are welcome. Let your glory fill the house. Let your peace fill the house. your joy fill the house joy fill the house jesus you're welcome jesus you are welcome let your joy fill the house as you have your bibles in your hand we are returning chapter 4 tonight. Let me tell you this as we are getting situated. Chapter 4 of the book of Galatians. We last read uh, verse 8. So we will begin there again and launch forward as the Lord permits. But as I was speaking, verse 8 and verse 9, as I was speaking to the Lord today, one of the things that he said to me was that on Friday, we should have a question and answer session. He said there's a lot of questions in the house. And now uh, let's clarify what the Lord means in case of question. And one reason why he's giving you uh, such notice is so if you want to, some of you don't want to ask the questions out loud, you can write them down on pieces of paper and bring them and we can collect them so no one even has to know what it is. But not curiosity questions. You understand questions that will help you live for God. Yeah. Not uh, not not who's King's wife. <laughs> um, and then after you ask that question, if you could get an answer to that question, that's not going to help you live for God. So we're not talking about just curious. What does the Scripture mean? We're not talking about those kind of questions. We're talking about questions that are not going to help you live for God. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. All right. So there's so you have time to pray to prepare and to have with your questions ready. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 9. We are continuing on the subject matter of let us not be weary in well-doing as we travel through the book of Galatians. Let's read this out loud. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, I'll turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be. Amen. Would you set your Bibles down and lift your hands to the Lord right now as we continue in the spirit of worship. Thank you so much for your people in this house. Strengthen us in our bodies. Strengthen us in our minds. We thank you for your people right now. We pray right now for their encouragement and let their spirits be fed that when all is over, said and done, they can say it was good for me to have been here. God, we pray right now that they would not hear the voice of a man, but they would hear the voice of their father. They would hear your voice and they would respond to your voice, God, be fed by your voice, guided, directed by your voice. And we thank you for the performance of it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you greet a few people around you tonight? And amen. Just smile at somebody. 
Let somebody know you're glad they're here tonight. That's right, come on, hug somebody. Come on, hugs are good for you, hugs are good for you. We are in the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians. This is verse 8 and verse 9 from the writing of the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia, warning them about going back to things that God brought them out of. We have discussed from last night how that God has brought us out of things, brought us out of fear, brought us out of worry, brought us out of carnal weapons. Would you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll begin at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll begin at verse 3. I want to discuss, discuss a little bit more just on what Paul is talking about, uh, about coming out of this bondage and not going back to the weak, beggarly elements of the world, beggarly. I know God didn't call you to be a beggar. Uh, you are a king's kid, and God did not call you to beg. Uh, and so he wants to discuss this. And, of course, Paul particularly is dealing with Judaism and going back to the law. But for our references and our sakes, what we are understanding Paul to tell us also is that when there is deliverance from things of the flesh, we don't return back to those things of the flesh. Amen. All right, Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 3. Listen to the Apostle Paul talk now, for though we, we, for though we, what? Right, Paul tells us, though you walk in the flesh, you do not war after the flesh. Okay, so Paul said, I want you to understand, you live in this fleshly body, but you have made an agreement with God not to use fleshly weapons. You don't war after the flesh. Say, I don't war after the flesh. Uh -huh. Now, for he goes on and tells us, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. So Paul then in verse 5 is going to tell us what these strongholds are. Casting down imagination. I want you to make note of that word because there's two words in it. Imagination. Image and nation. I want you to cast down the image that the nation gives to you. The image that the nation gives to you on what is a woman, what is a man. An image that the nation gives to you on what is a successful individual. He said, I need you to cast those things down. You do it. Do not govern your life by the world's definition of success nor the world's definition of what a man should look like or act like or what a woman should look like or act like. He said, cast that image down. How many know that these pictures on magazines of women and they look so flawless, how many know they're not real? How many understand they're computer, amen, generated or regenerated? Their, their flaws are covered over so that what you're looking at and trying to become is not even real. And that's why Paul said, cast that image down. If you look at a lot of the things that the world portrays to us, the woman that's supposed to be so glamorous looks like she ain't eaten in a couple of weeks. She, she, looks, belong, she looks anorexic. She looks like she's been on crack. And this is the beauty that the world portrays to us till now the world tells us there's a size called double zero. Uh-huh, lower than one, double zero. Yes, because that's the image that the world portrays. And, and so how many understand you are not to accept that image? How many recognize that you must be who God made you to be and learn to be thankful for it? 
Say amen. So Paul warns us about that, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. So Paul said, it is your job, it is my job to control our thoughts. It's your job to bring thoughts into captivity. You are not supposed to allow thoughts just to come in and rule you. Understand what he's telling us. The difference between an adult and a child is simplistically this. A child is ruled by what they feel. Child doesn't feel like going to school. Child does not feel like cleaning up the room. So as the adult, you must make them. An adult is ruled by what is right. Can I see the hands of you that always feel like going to work? Uh-huh. But now, can I see the hands of you that go to work? Right. See, that's an adult. An adult is ruled by what is right, not by what they feel. So the theme is this. You know, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. It's the understanding that it's right for me to do this in order to take care of my responsibility. That's all God is asking for. God is asking for you not to go by what you feel but to go by what is right. You may not feel like praising me, but you know it's right to praise me. So don't go by what you feel. Go by what is. You may not feel like coming to church, but you know it's right to come to church. So don't go by what you feel. Go by what is. Tell your neighbor, go by what's right. Don't go by what you feel. Go by what's right. When you go by what you feel, you are being child. You are being immature. You must go by what is right. And in so doing, you grow up into a spiritual adulthood. Now, come back with me to Galatians chapter 4, and let's begin to walk through the rest of this with the Apostle Paul. We're just highlighting the book. We're skipping and skimming and grabbing certain things as the Lord begins to lead us. Verse 19, verse 19 of Galatians chapter 4. My little children, of whom I travail and birth again, everybody say again, until Christ be formed in you. Hold on. <laughs> Apostle Paul, what are you trying to tell us? He said you went so deep into your flesh and carnality until you threw me back into labor. To have to give birth to you again. He said you went so deep into your flesh. Until I had to birth you again into the mind of God. Birth you again into the things of the spirit. I had to bring you forth again into these things. You were once upon a time in these things. But you went back into a wrong mindset. And so now you've thrown me back back into travail to bring forth where you should be or should have been long time ago. I don't know about you, my friend, but you've got to get tired, amen, of going through some of, some of the same stuff. I don't know about you, but in my Christian world, I got tired. I got sick and tired of always being sick and tired. I got tired of being depressed. I got tired of being lonely, tired of being frustrated. There, there has to be a dimension in God where you can grow past these things and that God does not have to keep doing what he did for you last service. That there can come a service where you walk in with what you had from the previous service. And you can look at God and say, what you gave me, I still have it. Now you can build on it and not try to restore it. You know why a lot of us can't grow? Because God's got to restore to you what he gave you last service. Yes, yes, yes. He's got to restore it. He's got to get you back to praising him again. He's got to get you to lift your hands again. He's got to get you to open up your mouth again. He's got to get you to give him glory again. He's got to restore those things so he never is able to build. So a builder that keeps laying the same foundations, how will he ever lay floors? How can he build up if he's got to relay the same foundations? Now, now, now let's get that straight. Let's, let's go to Psalm 150 a moment. Psalm 150. 
just so you can see it, verse 6, Psalm 150, verse 6. I want you to see what the psalmist tells us, David, the prophet of praise and worship, what he tells us, amen, and gives us this understanding of. Psalm 150, verse 6. If you have it, would you shout glory? glory. You know the scripture. Praise ye. Let everything that has do what? Now, now, watch what David tells us. David tells us that praise is not fundamental to holiness. It's fundamental to breath. So, in other words, what he's getting across is if you have difficulty praising, and this is fundamental to breathing, how can you breathe and live in the kingdom? How do you go on to deeper things like gifts of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit if you can't even do that which is fundamental not to salvation, but to breath. It doesn't say let everything that has Holy Ghost feel breath praise him. Let the crack breath praise him. Let the prostitute breath praise him. Anything that's breathing, you are commanded to give it back to God in praise. Make note of this. Praise is commanded. Uh -huh. He said now, let everything that has breath, the Hebrew word halal, we get our word hallelujah, halal, yah, J-A-H. If you notice with hallelujah, we pronounce the J with a Y sound because there is no J in the Hebrew alphabet. So we say hallelujah. So when you're saying hallelujah, you're saying praise the Lord. And he said, now this is fundamental to living. So the only excuse you have for not praising God is you're not breathing. Now, if you're not breathing, you're officially excused. Uh-huh. Just put your hand across your heart. Make sure you still got a pulse. All right. See, when you feel that, you know, you know I, I'm commanded to give God praise. <laughs> Yes, I'm commanded to give God praise. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because he's the giver of my breath. I'm commanded to use that breath back and give him. And so David is giving us this, this understanding that now praise is fundamental to living. Now watch this. Go back up to Psalm 149. Psalm 149. And, and, and look at verse 5, verse 5. Psalm 149, look at verse 5. Listen to David tell us this now. Let me show you how fundamental praise is supposed to be to us. Let the saints sing aloud upon their bed. Did you hear that? Did you see that? That when you actually lay down in your bed, God said, sing to me. Serenade your lover. Now, now you got to love God because God does not talk about quality of voice. He doesn't say only those of you that have good voices sing to me. Because they leave a whole lot of us out. God made nightingales. God made crows. And if you're a crow baby, crow on. We may not give you a mic, we may not put you on the praise team, but sing. We may have to tune an engine by your voice. Sing, baby. You might bring a tear to someone's ear. Sing. Mm -hmm. Let the saints sing. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. And that's what I love about God. He doesn't talk about the quality of your voice here. Whatever voice he gave you, use it and sing to him. Give him praise. Ah, glory, glory, glory. Somebody lift your hands that's got breath and open up your mouth and give God praise. Come on, that's it. Give him back his breath. 
Somebody's breathing in here. Somebody's got life. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor praise is not an option. Tell him it's a command. See, praise has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with your moods. It has to do with you breathing. As long as you're breathing, praise is commanded. Now, what God is trying to get across here, and even Paul is trying to get this across to us, is I'm having to travail in birth to get you back to where I first started you. And see, what happens to many of us is God has to birth us every service. He's got to get us back to where we first began rather than moving us on to where we need to be. So we've got to go back again and be reminded how good he is. We've got to be reminded of his miracles. We've got to be reminded that he woke us up this morning. How many know that God woke you up this morning? How many understand the alarm clock didn't wake you up? How many understand your internal body clock didn't wake you up? How many understand folks' alarm clocks went off and they didn't get up? Huh? It was God that woke you up this morning. It was God that started you on your way. Now, when you know that, nobody's got to tell you to praise him. See, your problem then does not become someone commanding you to praise. Your problem is someone's got to calm you down. Because when I recognize his goodness, uh, no wonder the psalmist said I'd fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say. Uh -huh. And so that's why when you understand how good he's been, you don't have to, someone don't have to tell you to lift your hands. Somebody don't have to tell you to open up your mouth. Honey, you just do it throughout the course of your day. It's just as natural as breathing. I don't have to think about breathing. I don't know about you, but breathing just comes natural. That's the way your praise is supposed to be. I, 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 I don't know what's happened sometimes to us as apostolics. I really don't. But, but, but sometimes it seems like the longer we are saved is the more settled we become to where we no longer praise. We just come in church, sit, and look like a deer in headlights. And even the only time our head really gets some movement is when somebody gets up and walk. Then everybody watches them. Wow, that's how you do it. Uh -huh. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to notice. Because what God is trying to say is the older you are in me, the stronger your praise and your worship ought to be in me. It ought not to be settling. It ought to go stronger. Oh, glory, 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 glory. You ought to get to the point where your feelings can't influence your praise. So when your flesh don't feel like praising, you look at your flesh and say, shut up. You've got nothing to do with this. I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalm 34, verse 1. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my... Where is your praise continually at? Uh -huh. That's why I understand how we quote that. It's amazing to watch saints even after testimony service. Saints stand up and quote that and wave their hands and get all excited and then sit down and don't open up their mouth for the rest of the service. Yeah. 
See, God's looking for somebody that's mature enough. You've grown up where God doesn't have to give birth to you every service on how to praise him. You don't need instructions every service on how to praise him. You don't need instructions on how to praise him when you wake up in the morning. Honey, you're learning to perfect your praise. Now, 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 just in case you did not know, preaching is not eternal. You are not going to heaven and give Michael a 10-point theological dissertation. You, 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 preaching is not eternal. There will be no need for preaching in heaven. But praise and worship, oh, that's eternal. You better get ready to join a heavenly choir, honey. Heaven is not a quiet place. You better get ready to open up your mouth and praise him with the chorus of the heavens. Hallelujah. Touch the person beside you. Tell them I'm getting ready for heaven. Getting ready for heaven. I don't mean to hurt your ears. Just getting ready for heaven. I don't mean to step on your pocketbook. Just getting ready for heaven. I don't mean to step on your toes. Just getting ready for heaven. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you in the face. Just getting ready. Getting ready for heaven. I am a praiser. Praise is what I do. Praise is who I am. Give somebody a high five and tell them I'm a praiser. I'm a praiser. If you want to know who I am, I'm a praiser. Tell somebody else I'm a worshiper. If you want to know who I am, I'm a worshiper. That's just who I am. That's just what comes out of me. That's just what I do. Uh, let, let, let me tell you, let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you when you know, let me tell you when you know you're really saved. Let me tell you when you know you're really saved. It's when you stub your toe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing what can come out of you when you stub your toe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of you, that little eight showed up. You know. Some of y'all remember from the other night, the little eight showed up. The, the big H got removed, and the little eight showed up. Holy Ghost got moved, and the hood came. That little H, that hood, you, you stubbed your toe and words started coming out your mouth like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and you wasn't saying Jesus at first. You said it after what you said. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh. That's why some of y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You want to see, see, when you saved and you hit your, oh, Jesus, thank you, hallelujah, glory, oh, God, oh, God. When you can just stub your toe and go to praise it, honey, that means the content of in there is praise, because stubbing your toe will bring out your content. Hi. It'll bring out your content. It'll bring out what's inside of you. When you stub your toe, honey, when praise can come out, praise is what's in. When other stuff comes out, guess what's in there? That's why you want to get so natural. See, when this thing's so fundamental to you, you wake up praising God. I've woken myself up sometimes in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. Hands lifted, big, beginning to praise God and to say hallelujah. You can train yourself to pray without ceasing. Even when you're asleep, your spirit is awake and you're still praying. Hallelujah. Honey, I've been speaking in tongues in my dreams because my spirit still prays even though my body's asleep. Mm, 
Tell ask somebody what's in your heart. <laughs> yeah, what's in your heart? <laughs> yeah, because see, God's going to raise up a people that have right content of heart. God's going to raise up a people that don't just have intellect and knowledge of the word, but God's going to raise up a people that are a doer of this word. God's going to raise up a people that will praise and worship him no matter what's going on because that's just fundamental to their life. <laughs> Honey, they get a flat tire, they go to praising God. <laughs> Yes, yes, well, the flesh says that's stupid. Why should I praise God for a flat tire? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 tells you why. Romans 8, verse 28. This is why you should praise Him no matter what your trial, no matter what your circumstance, no matter how you feel, you ought to give Him glory because you're not going by what you feel, you're going by what is. You're going by what is right. So Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know. Anybody know this? That all things work together for the good. I didn't say. The Bible doesn't say everything that happened to you was good. He said it will work together for the good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose uh, watch verse 29 for whom he did foreknow he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he may be the firstborn amongst many brethren so what God is trying to say is the reason why you can praise him when stuff is going wrong is because you already have the promise that all things work together for the good so you don't have to wait for the battle to be over you don't have to wait to see the outcome you can shout right now you don't have to wait to see it materialize you already know by faith what the end shall be and you know you're going to win so you're going to praise him like you know you've already won I tell somebody I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Yes, I am. I've already read the back of the book and I win. So that's why I can praise him when my tire goes flat. I don't know how you're going to do it. But I know you promised to work this out for my good. Some of you don't recognize God let your tire go flat. Just so you wouldn't get in an accident. Because the devil was planning for you for something down that road. So God had to Blow you up just to make you miss it. Some of you bless your heart, honey. You don't even understand why God let that grandma get in your way and drive like some little Sunday driver and you in a hurry. But God let them slow you up because danger was down the road. And sometimes when you got down the road, all of a sudden you saw an accident and the Holy Ghost quickened you and said, you should have been in that. But God who was rich in mercy uh, so you better praise him when you don't understand praise him when you do understand praise him when you feel like it praise him when you don't feel like it praise him when you like it praise him when you don't like it praise him when you're sick praise him when you're well praise him in the morning praise him in the noonday praise him in the evening praise Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, my God. Listen now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 4 and let's continue with the Apostle Paul a little bit here so that we can gain some more understandings. I'm in verse 22 now. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Everybody say two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by, someone say, a free woman. Paul is giving an allegory based off of the scripture of understanding. Now, now watch, watch this. I, 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 I'll read this to you just a little bit. But, but listen to Paul, verse 24. Or I'll, I'll, I'll do verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after. But he of the free woman was by the. In other words, he was born by the spirit or by promise. Which things are, someone say, an allegory. 
For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered to bondage, which is Hagar, Agar. Uh, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. He's speaking about the Ten Commandments. And answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Now, he simply says this. I want you to understand that mm, you need to check your mama. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Check your mama. You say, now what do you mean by that? Well, what Paul is trying to tell you is, by their fruit you shall. So if the works that you're producing are of bondage, you better watch origin. Mm -hmm. Let me go a little bit deeper, because some of you still aren't getting what Paul is saying. You remember, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, so that you can understand what Paul is getting at. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul tells the church this. He said, now, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. It means I'm very protective over you. I have much invested in you, Paul is letting them know. He said, for I've espoused you as a chaste virgin, even to one husband, Christ. Everybody say, I'm married to Jesus. So the church is the woman. The church is the womb. Uh Uh-huh. So now, whether you're male or you're female, you are the bride of Christ. Whether you are female or you are male, you are the son of God. Women, your sons. Men, your brides. Uh-huh. And so now what he's saying is, if that which you're producing is bondage, check your mama. In other words, what he's saying, check you. Because you the bride, and if you're producing something that's bound, you better check who you are. You better check whether you're out of Hagar, or you better check whether you're Sarah. Oh, Jesus. So if you're always producing bad moods, oh, God, you better check where you're coming from. You better better check you. You better check being the bride, because you are the wrong woman. You're a bond woman. Uh You're not a free woman. A free woman produces things by the spirit. A bond woman produces things by the flesh. So a bond woman will walk up and start telling you off because it sees you as the problem. A free woman will tell the spirit off that's influencing you because the free woman does not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Uh I wonder which one are you? All right, all right, all right. Look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Uh And so you can see this. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Uh, Listen to the wise man explain it. Uh, He's still talking about the bondwoman and the free woman also, but he's really talking about their works. So Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Uh, I wonder which one you are. Are you the free woman? Are you the bondwoman? Uh, ask someone beside you, who are you? <laughs> uh, you tell them or ask him, are you the free woman or the bond woman? <laughs> yeah, see, your works will tell. Your works are going to tell who you are now. And, you, know, you can claim all you want to claim, <laughs> but your works are going to speak for you. <laughs> see, a lot of you claim to be so deep and spiritual and wonderful with God, and you know, you hear the voice of the Lord and you walk real close with God. But when we check your works, it don't work. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it, they don't add up together. So now listen to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. He says, a foolish woman plucks down her house with her own hands, but a wise woman builds her house. And see, that's what's happening to some of you. You're a foolish woman. Yes, he's talking to men also. You're a foolish woman because you're a bride. You're a foolish woman because you keep tearing down the house of the Lord and you keep tearing down the house that God gave you to build, which is yourself. 
you are God's house and you keep tearing down God's house. You keep giving into depression. You keep giving into low self-esteem. You keep giving into worry. You keep letting these things tear you down. You keep giving into insecurity. You keep saying and letting the devil tell you that you can't do this. You're not qualified and I don't want to do this. You're a foolish woman because you keep tearing down the things of God. Mm -hmm. You're not a free woman. You're a bond woman because you keep producing things after the flesh. You keep producing things after your intellect and after your reasoning. And if it don't make sense to you, you're not doing it. And if you don't understand how this works, you're not working it. And if it's not explained to you in every single detail, you're not going there. Here's the problem. That's not faith. Uh -huh. See, some of you guys got God confused with things. That's not faith. When you work in the realm of faith, God, I know you want the whole atlas. I know you want the whole GPS system downloaded. But what God tends to do is just tell you, start driving. He didn't tell you you were going to California now. He just said, start driving. You had no idea that's where you were going. Then when you come up on the street, he says, take a left. Uh -huh. So he tends to tell you one street at a time, and only when you get close enough to the street does he tend to tell you where to turn. You don't know where you're going now. You're like Abraham. You're going to have to follow me. And you're going to have to trust me that I'm going to do right by you. I know you don't understand what's going on, but follow me. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, where you lead me, I will follow so I refuse to be the bond woman. I'm going to be the free woman that produces the things of God. I guess I got to go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, watch this now. Watch this now. The Bible begins to declare that Jesus was born of a woman named Mary. Everybody say Mary. The Hebrew word Mary, the Greek Mary is the Greek. The Hebrew name is Miriam. And it comes from the word Mara. Mara, which means bitter. So Mary actually means bitter. Figure this one out. Something bitter gives birth to the Messiah. Good. Now you've got to add in the factor that Mary was a teenager. According to theologians, Mary was approximately 14 or maybe 15 years of age when she gave birth to Jesus. A teenager raised the Messiah. And she was a bitter woman. Mm. Yes. Now, how does this work? Well, what God is trying to tell you is, no matter what your experience has been to make you bitter, it's still your choice what you give birth to. <laughs> you may have been molested, but you don't have to give birth to something of bondage. You don't have to be a Hagar. Oh, God. You may not have had a father, but you can still be a free woman and give birth to the things of God. God. Hold on, hold on. Watch how this works now. Mary gives birth to Jesus. But now watch this. The Antichrist is also going to come through a woman. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Messiah came through a woman. The Antichrist is going to come through a woman. It's up to you which one comes through you. I wonder what you're giving birth to. Are you giving birth to a Messiah? Are you giving birth to answers to your problem? Or are you giving birth to an Antichrist? Something that tears down your house. Something that's a bondage. Something that causes to contention. Something that makes things worse. What are you giving birth to? Touch your neighbor and say, what are you giving birth to? Uh, what are you giving birth to? Uh, mm -hmm, because uh, I've made up my mind, uh, even though the devil's tried to hurt me and tried to do me wrong, uh, I've made up my mind, uh, I'm going to turn my bitterness against the devil and give birth to a Messiah. 
Hallelujah. See now, when you become bitter towards God because of the hurts that you've gone through, then you're going to give birth to an antichrist. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19, so you understand it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. I want to tell you why the devil tries to hurt you. I want to tell you why he tries to hurt you, wound you, and disappoint you. I want to tell you why he doesn't want you, amen, to have good relationships with a natural father or mother. I want to tell you why, amen, he wants to interfere. I want to tell you why he wants to hurt you so you, you go through death and losses and, and, and you struggle because you look at God and almost want to blame God for everything. And so you have death in relationships whereby relationships separate. But then you also have natural death where you lost a child or you you're lost a parent and, and, and you're, you're, you're struggling. You still can't get over it. You're, you're, you're lost a spouse and, and, and you still can't get past these things. I want you to understand it. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. I want to tell you why the devil wants you offended, hurt. It's so that you will make yourself a defensed city. Now, this automatically violates the word of the Lord because God told Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, God told Abraham, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So God told Abraham, I'm your shield. I'm the one that protects you. I'm the one that protects your heart. So when you become a defense city, you find violate my word because you take my place so that's why the devil wants you to be a defense city he wants you to protect your own heart that's why he wants you to be a control freak that's why amen he don't want you to let nobody get no close to you some of you've already made up your mind you've made personal vows and god said you're going to break this vow because you made personal vows and nobody's going to get close to you no more ain't nobody going to ever hurt me like that ever again first of all honey i newsflash you are not your own you have been bought with a price first corinthians chapter six verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. And therefore glorify God in your spirit and in your body which are God's. So you don't have a right to make a vow like that. Because you are not your own. You don't have a right to say that. Oh my God. So you violate the concept and the understanding that you are not your own when you make vows like that. You say, preacher, you don't understand. I trusted this person. I opened up to them and they hurt me real bad. And I tried to do it again and open myself up and talk to somebody. And the next thing I know was all over the place. The next thing I know it was the sermon. I'm not going no more to nobody and talk. I'm I'm just going to work this thing out myself because folk make promises. Ministries say they're going to do stuff. People in the pew say they're going to help. But when the chips fall and stuff goes wrong, you standing by yourself looking crazy, amen, and feeling hurt because you trusted somebody. So I'm not doing that no more. God told me to tell you, you got to break that vow. You're going to have to look at God and say, I renounce that vow because I realize I am not my own and I refuse to become a defense city. Somebody said, will not be a defense city. <laughs> but the Lord is my help. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is my strong tower. The Lord is my buckler. The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my helper. Oh, yes, he is. And so it's God that must protect me. I cannot protect myself. Somebody lift your hands right now and start talking to God. Somebody right now, you got to break this vow. Break the vow. I renounce it. I renounce it. I break it. I said in my heart, nobody's going to do this again. I said in my heart, I'm not going to love no more. I said in my heart, I'm not going to open up to nobody no more. I'm just going to keep to myself. A lot of you, you, you got this game down. It's a game. You got it down. You make sure when you come in, you be real friendly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But you don't hang around too long because you want nobody all up, all up in your business. 
So some of you make sure you're one of the last ones to come in and one of the first to leave. So you hardly have to shake hands with nobody. Okay, I I've been missing you. Oh, well, you know, that happens sometimes. <laughs> Pastor said, I never seem to get to be able to shake your hand. Well, you know, Pastor, I know you're busy. Mm -hmm. You play these games. You play these games in order to protect your heart. God said, break the vow. Break the vow. Take the defenses down. That's my job. That's my position. That's my place. I'm your protector. I'm the one that watches over you. I'm the one that, amen, that must keep you. Let me tell you the way God's saying it. God said, you are not qualified to protect yourself up to your value. Now, for those of you that have under, some understanding of the crown jewels that are in England, they are what they call priceless. If I say priceless. It means that if you were to assess a price to them, you would be insulting it. You can say one trillion dollars, and that's an insult. Why? Because of the heritage that they carry along with their value, they are labeled as priceless. And so, when you have something that's priceless, my God, the security system. Cameras everywhere. Now, they used to let you walk up and look at the crown jewels of the queen. They don't let you do that no more. They have a moving sidewalk. You got yourself about a three-second look. Snap your eyes and remember. Because you can't take no pictures either. They won't let you take a camera. So they mean it. Snap your eyes and remember. Or buy a postcard. See, when it's priceless, the security system is high. So God said, you're, the, you're my crown jewels. I'm going to wear you like a jewel. And you know what God said? God said, you're sitting there in front of the crown jewels, and here's your security system. You got a water, you got a water pistol going, bring it. And, and the devil's coming with tanks, and you got a water pistol. God said, upgrade to a nuclear warhead. Give your neighbor a high five and say, it's time for an upgrade. You better upgrade your defense system, honey. Because what you're using is not sufficient. Hallelujah. You don't understand your value if you're trying to protect yourself. You really don't know who you are. If you're trying to guard your own heart, you really don't know who you are. You really don't understand who God made you. You really don't get your value. Because if you got your value, you look at God and say, this one's yours. Come on and lift your hands right now. And telling you some of you are struggling right now because some of you already got in your head you already got folk on your hit list who got to get told and some of you are already playing it out like on a movie some of you bless your heart you are worse than Hollywood ever could be because you played out like a movie like a B-rated movie if you already said it in your head if that person does that to me one more time you don't already acted it out in your head. And then you don't already gone over it a few times. Cut, edit, you are done already put some new scenes in. It's called as the stomach turns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 already, you, already got, you already got this thing moving in your head. God said, burn the film. Tell your neighbor, burn the film. Quit playing this stuff over and over again in your head. And look at God and say, you are my shield. You are my helper. You are my strong tower. You are my refuge in the time of storm. You are my buckler. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see it by word. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse 6. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. I, I, 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, so you can just see this. I, I want you to see what the Lord says now. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Watch God with this now. I'm going to give you a moment to find it. I, I know the Bible's new to some of y'all, so I'm giving you a little moment to find it. Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Whoso shall offend the least of my little ones, it was better that a millstone was hung around their neck and they were cast into the depths of the sea. Did, did you hear this? All right, you know, all right. Parents, you understand it. What's the greatest way to hurt you? Where do you think you got that from? You got that from God, the ultimate parent. And God said, whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. And it was better for them to have a millstone hung around your neck, hung around their neck. Now, remember, there's two types of millstone. There was the handheld millstone that the women used to use to make loaves of bread. Then there's the great millstone that the oxen would pull in order to thresh the wheat. That Greek word makes reference to the great millstone. The great millstone weighed one ton. God said, it's better that one tongue get wrapped around your neck than hurt one of my kids. Now, now think about this now. Let's reason together. One ton around your neck. Now, you don't got too many choices. I, you know, just from assessment, I'd say you got about two choices. One, the millstone snaps your neck before you hit the water. One ton around your neck? Yeah, I think you, your neck might crack. Two, if it doesn't snap, you ain't coming up. If you make it to the water, you ain't coming back up. You're going to be a flower garden at the bottom of the pool. Now, everyone say better. Okay, now, you, you, no, no, you, got, you got to understand why you're saying better now. See, some of you, don't, you're not getting this. You don't understand why you're saying it's better. It's better for you to die horrific death like that than face me. That's what he's saying. See, if you understood that, honey, you step aside. <laughs> I can't do nobody like Jesus. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. See, see a lot of you, you, you're not understanding. You're not understanding. Because if you did, you wouldn't do the stuff you do. The understanding, the, the lack of understanding is proof in, proved in your actions. The fact that when someone bothers you, you're ready to get spiritual and treat them like John the Baptist and take off their head. Mm -hmm. You want to behead them. Yeah, you want to tell them all. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that's why some of y'all are crazy, I'm telling you. You're always giving away pieces of your mind. I'm going to tell them all. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. That's why you're crazy. You're always giving away pieces of your mind. You don't got no mind left. Mm -hmm. That's why God said, hold your peace. Stop giving away pieces of your mind. Hold your peace. <laughs> I'll fight your. Oh, I, not we. Because, you know, some of y'all are like, yeah, yeah, God, you fight it. But, 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 you know, can I help? You know, I just want to tell them something, then I'll step back and let you do rest. And then some of you get real deep and spiritual. You get real deep and spiritual. Lord, I'm not involved in it at all. You know, this is your battle. I'm just asking one request, that when you get them, I'm there to see it. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> now, now, all right, Hebrews 12, 29. Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is? Now, I want to tell you why it's better that a millstone was hung around your neck. It's better that a millstone be hung around your neck than you meet up with the consuming fire. Now, if you understood this, then when someone hurts you, let me tell you what would happen. When someone actually hurts you, you would actually start praying for mercy. Don't hurt them, Jesus. Don't hurt them, Lord. Have mercy on them. Amen. Have mercy on them, God. I, I, I know you're protective over me. And, and you know they didn't do me right. And I know you're about ready to stand up. Have mercy, Lord. 
Because can't nobody do you like Jesus. Listen, honey, folk can go to sleep and, 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 and snore you out. What do you do with a God that hops in your dreams? God hopped in Abimelech dreams when he took Sarah from Abraham and said, if you touch the woman, you're a dead man. Only God can hop in your dreams and threaten you. In your dreams, threaten you. This is a serious God. Touch your neighbor's ass, serve a serious God. Now, you know, you know, God is so serious, so good. He's serious, but he's good. He's so good that he actually let the man defend himself in his dreams. Saying, Lord, but I didn't know that, 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 that you know, this woman belonged to this man. He let in, her, in his dreams, gave him the conscious ability to talk and defend himself. The Lord said, I know, I kept you from it. But if you get some notion in your head and decide to touch her, you are a dead man. Game over. Let me lick you down good month. Just dead. You don't mess with a God like this. When you understand that, friend, you stop trying to defend yourself and you step aside. Because I don't have what it takes to threaten somebody in their dreams. I don't have what it takes to take someone's life like that. When you recognize that, you look at God and say, thank you for loving me. That boss that just told you off and bit your head off and spit it back in your lap and blamed you for stuff you didn't do. Honey, if you understand it, you're walking back to your seat saying, Lord, have mercy. They don't understand. See, that's why some of you need revelation because what some of you are doing going, Lord, get them, get them, Jesus, get them. You know, some of you laughing because you know you do it. Just, just get them, Lord. They don't deserve no mercy. They done did this once too often. They hurt me too bad. See, but when you know who you're serving, you look at God and say, thank you for protecting me. Thank you for what? Somebody lift your hand and say, thank you for protecting me. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you that... Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Hold on, I want you to see something here. Zechariah chapter 2. Okay, for some of you, let me help you out there because, you know, the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi and Zechariah is right before it. All right, Zechariah chapter 2 because I might as well be saying something in Hebrew. All right, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Listen to the prophet. The prophet is talking here. Prophet of Zechariah, he's talking. And he's talking about now, after the nations that plundered you, they, they spoiled you, they hurt you. He said, I've been sent to those nations. Listen to this, because I'm really coming to the middle portion of the verse. He that toucheth you touches the apple of his eye. Everybody see where I'm talking from? God said, when someone touches you, they touch the apple of my eye. <laughs> now, now watch this. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. How can you have low self-esteem and believe this? 
How can you feel like you're ugly and nobody's going to want you? How could you ever feel that you're going to grow old and nobody's ever going to want to be with you? How could you feel that you're a nothing and a nobody and believe this? How could you ever swallow from the devil that you will never amount to anything and believe this? Does anybody believe the word? How could you ever feel that your God would abandon you even when you've done wrong? Now, hear me now. You may have messed up your destiny. Maybe the A destiny that God had planned for you, you no longer can obtain because of choices you have made. Maybe now you've got a C destiny. But he already told you, I'll never leave you. I'm, I'm going to let that sit in somebody's spirit right there. Because you've been believing the enemy too long. And the, see, this is, this is why Paul said, I'm travailing in birth again for you to you. I'm trying to get you back to the fundamentals of believing that God even loves you. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. I, I want you to see the middle portion of the verse. The middle portion of the verse. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. But Paul, 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 Paul is, that's why Paul's saying, I'm travailing. I'm travailing in birth again. I'm trying to get you back to some fundamentals. I'm trying to get you to rest and believe in what I've said. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8, in the middle, the middle portion of the verse. He said, charity, which is, of course is love, covers a multitude of, not faults. See, a lot of people quote it and they say multitude of faults. This is multitude of? It exposes it? Oh, it covers it. Now, that's why we're all alive right now. Because there's not one of us in this house that don't have multitude of sins. And nobody in this house came out of the womb speaking in tongues. Amen. You didn't come out of the womb going, see my tie, tie my tie. Nobody, nobody came out of the womb speaking in tongues. We were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So we were conceived in sin. We were all born with a sinful nature. Many, we found it many times easier to sin than to do what's right. We found it a lot of times easier to tell a lie than to lift our hands and give a praise. That's why God said, don't go by what you feel, go by what's right. Amen? So his love covered a multitude of our sins. You say, how can I make it? I'll tell you how you can make it. His love covers a multitude of our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So the devil brings up my sins and my failures up before me, and God says, I don't see what you're talking about. Because the, if something's covered, honey, it's out of you. It's... I've already moved that. I've already taken care of that for you. Now what you got to do is just show me appreciation. Show me appreciation by be willing to work for me. Show me appreciation by being grateful that I called you. I know I'm not supposed to be able to do this. I know I shouldn't even be able to sing this song. I know I don't have the right to call your name. But the fact that your love covered me, I'm going to sing it. I'm going to call your name. I'm going to give you praise.
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Somebody that's been redeemed, say so. Hallelujah. 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 Ha 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 ha. Go, go, say, hey, hey. Yeah, ho, ho. Shut up. Thank you. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10. I want to show you the difference between godly conviction and satanic condemnation. And the reason why a lot of you are struggling right now is you will not allow yourself to release your sins. Simplistically put, you haven't forgiven yourself. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Now before we read this, I need some honesty in the house. I'm going to want you to act like a swivel chair and look around in just a moment. Can I see the hands of you that have no sin? Everybody look around. Turn around now. Because if anyone raises their hands, we're we, 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 we moving like oil. We're moving like an army. So we're going to have to rebuke the person now, that devil. <laughs> I didn't say rebuke the devil. I said rebuke the person out the devil. That's a straight up devil. All have sinned. All of you that have sinned, let me lift you, let me see your hands. Thank you for being real. Thank you for being real. Because I have some more with your name on it. All right, so all have sinned. So there's nobody in here that has no sin. Now that this is not to endorse us to continue in sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God? All right. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace forbids you from sinning. We are not supposed to stretch grace into disgrace. Saying now that we got grace, we can do anything we want to do. And God will forgive me. All right. Now 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh. Everyone say death. Now what's the difference between godly conviction and satanic condemnation? Very simple. When you sin, God points to himself. First of all, the first thing you need to see, everyone say godly sorrow. Godly sorrow means this is an attribute of God. It means that nobody can repent their own heart. Repentance is a gift from God. We do not have the ability to repent our own heart. Have you ever done something wrong and wasn't sorry? Come on, I need some more honest folk in here. Hmm? This was many, many years ago, but somebody was bothering me on my job. They had been bothering me and bothering me and bothering me and bothering me. One day I told them off in right fashion. Ooh, that felt good. Now, I knew in my head I was wrong. I wasn't the least bit sorry. In fact, you know what I heard myself saying? Ooh, I wish I had a chance to do it again. I should have said some more stuff. There was some stuff I really should have said. <laughs> I know you don't got that problem. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I was almost praying for another opportunity. Now, in my head, I knew I was wrong. Wasn't the least bit sorry. Mm. In fact, it was getting satisfaction from replaying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
You know what I had to do? I had to go to God and say, repent my heart. I need godly sorrow. It's not human sorrow. It's godly. It's only an attribute of God. You can only get it from God that works repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. See, some of you don't understand. If your heart gets convicted and God brings repentance, don't get mad, honey. Don't get embarrassed. Don't get upset. Get grateful. Because repentance is a gift from God. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. So when God convicts your heart, God then points to himself as your answer. So God points to your sin, then God opens up his arms and says, come here. Let me hold you. Let me teach you. Let me help you. Let me instruct you. Let me show you so you don't have to keep repeating that. Well, God, I'm having trouble drinking. I keep picking up the alcohol. God says, that's wrong. Don't do that. Come here. Let me show you how to get drunk on new wine. Be not drunk with wine wearing to excess, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, so now, but the sorrow of the world, excuse me, not, let me not forget that part, not to be repented of. So in other words, when God convicts me, when he really convicts me, he does such a good job at convicting me and making me want to change because repentance is a change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude, and a change of direction. So when God really repents my heart, that's not a 360 because the 360 goes back to where I started. It's a 180. So if I'm going north, I now go south. So repentance is such a thorough job of conviction that the Bible said not to be repented of. In other words, I'm not sorry that I got caught. See, some of the reason why some of you repent is you got caught. And what you're sorry about is that you were dumb enough to get caught. I knew I shouldn't have told that person. So you're not really sorry for the act. You're just sorry that you got caught. Not to be repented of. Don't be sorry that you're sorry. That's what that means, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh. Now, how do I know? Satanic condemnation now makes me feel like dying. Whenever the devil condemns me, I feel like a failure. I feel like quitting. I feel like, what's the point of praying? I'm never going to make it anyways. What's the point of coming to church? I'm just a hypocrite. So I might as well just stay out in the world and do what I'm going to do rather than hypocrite up in the church. God doesn't make you feel like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, when you have that satanic condemnation, you don't even feel like lifting your hands. You don't feel like you've got a right to open up your mouth. But when you've got godly sorrow, God says, you didn't do that right, but you're still my boy. You're still my son. I don't disown you. You're my child. Come, get in my lap. Let me take care of you. Let me teach you. Let me train you. Let me show you how to whoop upon the devil and make him pay for this. Hallelujah. Uh, and that's why some of you are struggling right now. Because you, you, the devil keeps reminding you of stuff you did a year ago, two years ago, six months ago. Some of you right now, the reason why you're struggling in churches, the devil says, well, you ain't prayed all week. Here it is Wednesday, and you ain't even prayed outside of church. Don't, don't be coming up here and lifting your hands and act like you're spiritual. Just, just sit there and just nod your head every now and again. Now, this is where you look at the devil and say, get out, my, get out the conversation. Get, get out the conversation. Because <laughs> this is between God and I. And if God chooses to forgive me, who are you? Why do you keep letting to the devil tell you how God's going to react when God already told you? God already told you, I'd forgive you. First John chapter 1 verse 9. If you confess your faults. He's faithful and just to for, do what? Forgive us and to cleanse us. All. All. Not faith. 
the, no, no, see, here's where the others are struggling. The word forgive means to release from the penalty of your wrongdoings. When God forgives you, he releases you from the penalty of what you did wrong. So you know what God expects you to do now? He expects you to look at the devil and say, I'm free. The devil says, but you did this, you did this, you did this. You say, that's all true. And look, there's blood all over it. I said, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's such a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! I'm free! Uh, sometimes you got to reach back and get some of those old songs. I feel all right. There is no condemnation. I can testify that there's no condemnation. So God set me free, and that's why God's saying when you accept this, I don't have to travail and birth again and try to bring you back to the foundation of forgiveness. When you've done something wrong, come to me, ask me to convict your heart, ask me to help you to change, and ask me to help you to make the devil pay. Come on and lift your hands and give God glory right now. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody right now. Somebody right now needs to ask God to help you to forgive yourself. Hear the word of the Lord, Bethel. The Lord said God's having to travail again in birth. Because this is the 50th time you've been asking him to forgive you for the same thing. The first time you asked. Forgive him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And every time the devil brings it up in your head, you know when he brings it up to you a lot of times? When you're trying to pray, you're trying to praise, you're trying to get next to God. All of a sudden this foolishness comes up in your head of what you did, what you said. What you didn't do, that's right. Comes all up in your head. And what you got to do is look at the devil and say, I am forgiven. You are not my Lord. You are not my God. My God said he's forgiven me. And this is between my God and I. This ain't got nothing to do with you. So get out of the conversation. I'm telling you, some of you right now need to lift your hands and tell the devil, read my hand, because my mind's busy praising God. Read the hand, buddy. Read the hand. Because I don't got to explain to you why God wants to forgive me. I just got it like that. Because I'm his boy. He loves me. I'm his son. And his love covers a multitude of my sin. I'm free to lift my hands. I'm free to open up my mouth. I'm free to experience the presence of God. I'm free to shout. I'm free to dance. I'm free to glorify him. feel a liberty in this house. I don't know how some of y'all are sitting there, but I feel a Holy Ghost rumble. Uh, oh. Free. I'm a free woman. Free. Free to give birth to a Messiah. Free.
When you keep letting those sins stay up in front of your face, that makes you a bond woman. That keeps you in bondage. You're going to give birth to the things of the devil. I want to tell you what I feel right now. I hear the Holy Ghost saying that, honey, it's not time to come to a physical altar, but it's time to lose your liberty. Some of you need to get out your seat. We got a whole lot of room. Walk to the back. Walk up here to the front. Honey, you need to lift your hands. Some of you need to come walk under the front. Walk to the back. Walk up and down the aisles. For real. Some of you need to excuse your, say, excuse me, but I got to get out of this seat. Excuse me, my husband. Excuse me, my wife. Excuse me, my brother. Excuse me, my sister. But I need out. I need out. I got to take a walk on the God side. I've been walking long enough on the human side. Got to take a walk on the God side. Free, free to have joy, free to have peace, free from torment, free from shame, free from condemnation, free from low self-esteem, free from intimidation, free. Give somebody a high five and tell them I'm free. Say by the ordinance of God, I'm free. By the command of God, I'm free, free to smile. Woo! I'm free to have a smile on my face. You know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. I am, I am, I am. Oh! I feel a preacher up in here about right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because God said, it's time you come out. Some of you that are walking around, you might have to grab somebody that's sitting there, that's standing there, and tell them it's time for you to come out. Come out. Come out. The prison door is open. What you doing locked up in prison? Come out. He loose you. He's got the keys of death and hell. Come out. Stop sitting in that depression. Stop sitting in that loneliness. Come out. Stop sitting in that fear. Come out. Come out. Come out. You know I'm free. Now lift your hands right now. Our time is winding down, but would you lift your hands and open up your mouth? And would you go to worshiping him? Would you go to worshiping him? Oh. Somebody's not done walking in their liberty. Somebody's not done expressing their liberty. I know somebody just walked back to their seat. But somebody ready to say, excuse me again. I got to get back out. Woo! I carry. 
carried this guilt long enough. I carried this shame, this embarrassment long enough. Free. 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 over here it's a Holy Ghost party I love this when some brothers get the revelation that they're free any more brothers want to come to the front and just praise him like you're free? Hey! Woo! Turn me loose, let me go, turn me loose. Give somebody a high five and tell them, I'm going to give birth to the things of God. I'm going to give birth to the things of God. Because I'm free. I'm free. I'm going to give birth to the things of God because I'm free. I've been a Mary. I've been bitter. But now I'm bitter against the devil. I'm going to give birth to the things of God. Free. Our moderator, come on. I want to tell you one last thing as she's coming. Ah, Shekoto.
Come on. I want you to understand this. That when you beat yourself, when you beat yourself, when you beat yourself up and call yourself stupid and foolish and I'm no good and I'm never going to make it. And what you're telling God is his beating was not sufficient for you. He was beaten to take care of the whole world, the sins of the whole world. And so when you're beating yourself, what you're telling God is your beating was not sufficient. Therefore, I've got to beat myself to add to it, to make it sufficient. But I wonder if there's somebody in this right now that will lift their hands and tell the Lord your beating is sufficient. I don't have to need to add to it. Your beating is sufficient. I don't need to beat myself. Your beating is sufficient. I don't need to whip myself up. Your beating. Ah. And give God a praise. Put your hands together, lift up your voice and give God a praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!